Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you may be. Happy Ramadan to all Muslims. Warm salutes to everyone who is here today for participating in these series of uh, meetings that we're doing on Sudan on how to reimagine the security sector in Sudan. I'm Luca Byung Bengwal, the academic dean at the uh, Africa Center for Strategic Studies, and I'm the supervisor for the academic program for the strategic studies in Africa. And uh, all of these uh, conferences, I'll be the moderator for this uh, session. These group of meetings that we have on the Sudan, on the security sector, uh, and the democratic transformation is organized by the Africa Center uh, for Strategic Studies and the USIP. First of all, I'd like to thank you all once again. Uh, and this is a continuum of the last meeting uh, for the uh, role of security. This is the fourth meeting of the five meetings this uh, in conference, we are actually going to be looking at the strategic plan as a practical tool. Uh, we will delve into the importance of developing such a program for the, Amer the democratic transition of the Sudan. On the 26th of April on 2 p.m. on Sudan time, we uh, Let's uh, delve into some of the details for the upcoming uh, parts of this meeting. Like we said, it's good about the it's going to be about the national strategy as a practical tool. The first goal is to discuss the logical base for developing a strategic stra uh, uh, plan uh, as a as a as a practical tool to uh, solve the goals pertaining to Africa. Second is to uh, convey the uh, purposes behind such a plan and the partnership and the participation of all the beneficiaries to serve the citizen. And what are the major components of such a document? The third goal is to examine some of the challenges that could be possible when developing uh, such a plan and how to overcome these kinds of obstacles and challenges. Before I introduce the speakers for today, please allow me to uh, give you a presentation about the most important things from the previous meetings and some of the lessons learned about how to uh, reform the security sector from African experiences in the past. So the point here is to, as you know, providing uh, human and individual security is very important. As we know, there's a lot of nations and governments that cannot provide that. Uh, even that they are spending more on security, they still cannot provide. In some countries, the country, the nation, Actually, the governments have become a factor for instability, instability, and 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 this has made things more complicated. And the, of course, this goes back to the lack of good governance, which uh, ripples down all through society. And being that there is no political will and strategic planning, and uh, being that there is a lot of resistance in reforming the security sector causes these two in a lot of African nations. There are examples for a lot of nations in Africa who do have national view and strategy visions that have s succeeded in the security sector and have been able to take a leap forward in the political uh, reform and economic reform. 
And these nations, knowing that the uh, bringing stability would be a confidence booster, problem is a lot of these nations have not achieved this yet. The security sector is linked to every and those that plan and manage and provide and oversee the security factors in any citizen's life. But to reform the uh, security sector is defined as, which is the try to uh, uh, help in the uh, remolding of the policies of all the agencies that are partners in providing the security of a nation to make them more responsive and more efficient to achieve the goals of all citizens, which is justice and balanced uh, daily life. So it is not something that is limited to those countries who have who are signatories on this uh, agreement but it's for all countries around the world who are trying to go towards more of a democracy to, to a democratic system and specifically in Africa, the national security. There are many studies done that a proper and well done national strategy plan with full participation of all the uh, people that should be a part of it is very beneficial to stabilize the nation and to tackle challenges that may face any nation. The National Strategy Plan is a policies for strategy to bring more security to the nation and the people and the citizens. And then sometimes these uh, can be actually even described as a roadmap and a compass to achieve the national strategies uh, which is mostly reforming the, the security uh, sector uh, and the economy. Uh, I mean, the way it's molded is much more important than, than, than it's done, the how of it, of how it's done. And uh, uh, of course, the way it's molded can give an opportunity when putting it together to open a dialogue within the society of all the factions and to discuss and to talk about uh, the issues socially and how to revisit and how to look at relook at their own identity and uh, to uh, achieve the uh, justice transition and sustainable uh, justice. And the African nations who are under the umbrella and the agreement of this, the issue is that there if you if you do find uh, such a thing in some nations, uh, the point is to find nations and people of those countries who did take part in molding this. The relationship the, of the reform and the of the national security and the strategy, being that the definition of the security sector and the reform of it uh, has to do a lot with the uh, security policy. The thing is, is how to embed it in the entire national security plan. There are very good examples from some African nations like Liberia, which adopted the reform within the national security plan, which uh, and which uh, created an opportunity to uh, to improve the situation. There are many examples in African countries that started the reform of a security sector without the national security strategy, without adopting a national security strategy. So the strategic leadership uh, is rather uh, uh, built on institutional, uh, rather, plays an important role to, to create uh, a, 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 the necessary envir environment for the national security and for the, the security. So the vision is very important in this regard. I am very pleased today to uh, present or to introduce the presenters for this session, who uh, the, those presenters have a wide experience and are uh, have the expertise, the necessary exper expertise to talk about the national security strategy uh, development. We have Dr. Fairley Chapuis, we have Dr. Uh, of course, uh, 
uh, and other speakers, the, their bios are available, but I will focus on their expertise in the field of national security. Let's start with uh, Dr. Uh, Fairly Shapri, of course. She is an expert. She's, an, uh, of course, uh, an independent, uh, she is an independent expert in conflict and security uh, in Africa. And uh, uh, Dr. Fairly Shapri has, uh, of course, looked at the international security sector uh, has, is part of the uh, national security sector uh, advisory team and has completed projects for the European Union, the Danish Refugees Council, the Small Arms Survey and Survey. She has worked at the Geneva uh, Center for uh, Governance. It's a, a leading uh, 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 center. Uh, Dr. Fairly Chapuis Chap has a uh, is, uh, holds a master's from the Geneva Graduate Institute and a doctorate from the Otto Sir Institute of Political Science at the Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, the second speaker who is present is uh, Dr. Emil uh, uh, Wedraugo. He's an adjunct professor of practice at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. He's specializing in issues related to national security strategy development and security sector reform and governance. Uh, Dr. Emil has helped a lot in the, uh, of course, the, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies in, for the design, has helped in the design of the strategy. And he is a, a member, of course, of the uh, Africa Center. As I said, speaker, facilitator, and author. He has also worked with Partners Global, has worked in Burkina Faso, and he has uh, uh, he has been the scientific council and the uh, an important member at the Burkina Faso, and uh, he has worked at the uh, security sector, and he has worked in Madagascar, worked in the field of governance. He has worked as a minister of security in Burkina Faso and has uh, helped in the design of the national security strategy. And he has helped, uh, of course, in the design and the understanding of the community policing and has helped a lot in security matters. He has worked as a uh, Burkina Faso, as I said, with the Burkina Faso army. He's retired from active duty in 2012 as a colonel, having served in positions including aid to the prime minister, support Regiment Commanding Officer and Chief to, of the Military Intelligence Division at the Army General Staff. He has also, he was a parliamentarian at the National Assembly of Burkina Faso and the ECOWAS Parliament. Dr. Emil has, of course, earned his PhD from uh, the Center for Diplomatic and Strategic Studies in Paris, France. And of course, he, his PhD uh, covered the uh, security sector reform and governance in the ECOWAS region. Thank you very much, dear presenters, Dr. Emil and Dr. Fairly Chapri, for your presence. Uh, we will start our dialogue, ladies and gentlemen, with uh, Dr. Fairly Chapri, who is present with us. Dr. Fairly Chapri, my first question is as follows. Be based on on your revisions uh, of the on the revisions that you've made of the national security strategy um, is it possible ma'am to explain to the uh, participants the difference between the policy the national security policy and the national security strategy and of course we would be grateful if you could uh, enlighten us on the on the on the on the stages, uh, the stages uh, pertaining to the national security strategy in uh, Africa. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're hearing me clearly and happy Ramadan as well. Um, so yeah, for the question, um, a national security policy is about what national security is for. It's about the objection, objectives. Um, a national security strategy is about how to get that job done. So what do you wanna do? How are you going to do it? Just very simply. Now, 
In reality, uh, often the policy part of the national security is, is, is attached to the national security strategy part because it's much easier to know how you're going to do something if you know first what it is you aim to achieve. So that's why we talk about in the toolkit national security strategy development. In some countries, these two documents are separate. They're established at different levels. And sometimes they come with different names and different places. So there's a lot of variety. But the basic thing to remember is policy is about what, strategy is about how. And it's really important to have um, this clear vision for what you want to do with national security, for where a country is going with this. It's obviously the primary responsibility of the government to set direction for its national security and, and the security of the population. And that's what the national security strategy should be doing. Um, it's a tool, also a very important tool for sing signaling peaceful intentions, both to regional neighbors and international partners, but also to internal um, populations and internal stakeholders, because it's a statement about values and objectives and, and what, how the country sees the stakes of security. So national security strategy development is part of the AUSSR framework. It seems that you guys have already been having a discussion about that. Um, and it's a particularly important um, thing to have in place, to have this conversation about what security is, who it should be for, what are the objectives, the visions, the values involved, and how to achieve that in a reform context, because in a reform context, one of your key questions will be how to change from a security sector that may not be able to meet those goals towards one that will be fit for and primed for that mission. Um, so that's what, and it's also in an SSR context, a very useful tool for coordinating external support to SSR processes. So it's just a few links to what you've been looking at. In terms of the process, um, how are you going to get there? Uh, in our toolkit, which I'm sure many of you have seen, we work through a number of phases. And the first phase is planning. Um, that means don't just jump in there and start writing it. It means think about how, how the sort of six to 18 months that it will usually take to draft such a strategy are going to be used. It means having logistics questions answered and a clear process lead so that um, when things get difficult further down the track, you already have a process in place. Um, so that's what we call the planning phase. We then, once you've got a clear sense of how the process is going to go, you can go into what we call the pre-drafting phase. And the pre-drafting phase is the part where um, we're really looking at uh, the key questions that lead into uh, how a um, how the drafting itself will go. What questions do you need to answer in order to be able to move? You? If we if we turn off the video, it might be better, eh? I'll I'll give it a go. Here we go. Um, okay. So yeah. So we got to the point of consultation and review. And once a draft has been through a, a process of, con of being shared with a broader range of actors, including the public, but also stakeholders, it can then be revised to make sure that all of those points of view are reflected. There then follows a process of adoption and approval. It's really good practice if that includes the parliament. And if you'd like more um, details about that, we discussed this in the toolkit. We then move on to um, a next stage. You might think at this point, once it's been approved, it's ready, it's finished. But no, in fact, it's really important to think about dissemination and communication around a national security strategy. That means on the one hand, making sure the strategy is shared actually with all of the government stakeholders who are going to be involved in its implementation. And often in many contexts, that's a critical step that gets neglected but also ensuring that the review, the strategy itself is shared with the public because it's a, a beautiful moment, a really critical moment to sensitize the public to the need, to the kind of secure, national security that a government may be aiming for and how they intend to implement it. And then finally, once you've, you've gotten to that stage, you can begin with the implementation, which is the final stage. But every good strategy should include also a process for monitoring and review um, so that once it's as its implementation is executed, at some point there will come a, a time when uh, feedback from that implementation process can move into a new strategy development or review of the strategy as it's currently in place.
How does that sound? Very, thank you very much. You are very clear, but we would like you really to, if you can try again, whether we can have you, uh, your video on, because we are very clear now without video. Um, the, the second question, um, uh, fairly, because fairly is, uh, uh, so let me switch to Arabic. Uh, is it possible to uh, determine uh, to the participants or to uh, share with us, Dr. Feli Shafi, uh, some of the fee, uh, to, 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 to share with us your views regarding the context in Africa. It's a little bit complicated, you know, and uh, especially especially in the, uh, in the given the, the challenges and given the uh, difficulties existing in the African context. Uh, what's your view on this, man? Thank you. Yeah, um, I think uh, you've asked your question um, was what are the core elements common in all national security strategies? I'm going to tell you what I think the um, elements are of all good national security strategies. And obviously that means asking a question about what makes a strategy good. And I think the answer is it has to be something that is practical. It's something that has can act as realistic in its objectives and in its execution, and it will actually be implemented so that it moves from the level of objectives and visions and values, and it actually becomes a tool for changing the way that the security sector does its everyday work. Um, that means that um, there's a few things that need to be included. First of all, there has to be a definition of security. Security is many different people um, and for many different stakeholders, especially in contexts which are confronting reform and transition. So actually making sure that there is a dialogue that leads to a shared definition of security perhaps helps to establish this broader vision. Um, it's useful if it's inclusive and participative. Um, and that's a key element of uh, a national security strategy because it's, it's really the framing, it's really the bedrock for what you're trying to do. Um, linked to that, it's also really important to define what are the national values that are critical to guiding implementation towards this vision of security? What is it that's important? And for that, uh, in many cases, there are sources in the legal framework, perhaps a constitution, perhaps um, more organic laws, um, local cultures, national traditions. Um, and that's also the, the question about what values are important to a society and to a nation for their vision of national security is also um, a really important dialogue to have. And on the basis of that, the reason why those two things are so important, even though they sound theoretical, even though they sound sort of ambiguous, the reason they're important is because they guide um, prioritization. In security, everything is important and everything is, you know, it often feels like everything is an emergency. Um, no strategy will be able to approve to achieve everything. So it's important to decide what to do first, setting, one priority or a smaller number of priorities that um, are guided by objectives that are based on this vision and definition of security is really important. And setting those priorities is really important because it's linked to the next element um, that's included in a, in, a, in a security strategy. And that's a division of labor. It's really important that um, at some point there's a discussion of who is going to do what in terms of implementation and that decision about who is going to be doing what needs to be linked to the priority prioritization of objectives, which needs to be linked to the definition of security and the values that guide its implementation. And once you've, once you've got that far, um, that can help you move towards a plan for implementation, which is critical to making sure this is both a values-based document and a practical tool for security provision. And for that, you need a process of follow-up and review. There needs to be, writing the document is not enough, there needs to be an authority that is responsible for, for monitoring its implementation, monitoring if things are working as intended and suggesting action that can be taken to correct course and gathering information to feed into the review, the life cycle of the national security strategy, which should be a living document. And of course, just finally, it's really helpful to making this all more realistic if it's all clearly costed and linked to responsible financial planning um, 
at the at the highest level as well. Uh, 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 Dr. Fairley. Thank you, Dr. Fairley, for distinguishing the uh, major components for the National Security Plan. And these are, one could say, uh, uh, very mutual for all of the strategies, one could say, easily. Uh, the Before the last question, can you tell us, please, the major uh, challenges for a national strategy plan in a complicated nation, a, a complicated security situation in a nation like the Sudan? And how can one overcome these challenges? There are always a lot of challenges. Um, I'm going to give you three that I think are um, particularly important to anticipate. One of them is getting political buy in at the very highest level. Um, because that will really be critical to pushing forward through a process that's likely to be uh, tense at certain points. There will be disagreements. There will be, um, as parts of the security sector or parts of society who feel challenged by these discussions, especially when it's um, a new kind of process. So having political buy-in at the highest level is really the the most important thing to make sure that all of the actors come to the table and continue with this discussion. Um, equally, that's really important for sustaining the process because national security strategy development itself might take anywhere from six to 18 months, perhaps longer in a few contexts, but then its implementation has to go on a, usually over a process of years before going through a new review process. If there's not political support at the highest level, it's really going to, there is a real risk that momentum will be lost and the process will be jeopardized. So that's one thing, high level political buy-in. The second thing is getting everyone, and this, this might sound a bit warm and fuzzy, but it's really important that from the beginning, from as early as possible, there's a shared understanding among all of the stakeholders about what its security means and what security strategy is for and how the process will go forward. That also helps create a sense of importance around these issues. And then finally, um, the third challenge that I think is um, moving from um, a situation where there's a nice vision, there is perhaps um, a nice definition, there's, there's values are defined, it's, it's, it's a very nice policy, but moving into implementation, making sure that um, something that is a high level political document that is strategic and perhaps um, not so concrete gets translated through a process of sectoral planning into actionable um, policies and, and operations at, at the all the way from the top to the bottom. So moving from vision to implementation over a sustained period is also a challenge as well. But there are solutions to all of these challenges. Yeah, Dr. Feli, thank you very much. Dr. Feli, thank you very much for your answers. Uh, answering these challenges, of course, uh, no doubt that the Sudanese will try to benefit and make use of that wisdom. Last question, if I may, uh, uh, if it could be more like uh, an advice if you could give for the Sudanese reality that we have, what would be the crucial advice that one could convey, that you would convey onto the Sudanese people in their intent to establish and develop a national strategy in the democratic transitional stage that are in, in Sudan? Well, I, I wouldn't presume to, to speak um, for the Sudanese context because I, I certainly don't know enough about it and I doubt any outsider really could. But um, at the, that's then also though part of my advice Part of my advice is focus on creating a truly national vision. And that means going beyond what the government thinks. Um, it means going beyond what the typical sort of national stakeholders think. That means being inclusive and being participatory. So that when this is so that when this is reflected back to the population as a national vision, 
everybody can recognise their own concerns, their own sense of security in, in the plan that's being developed. Um, and that was really important, not just for the legitimacy issues, because the legitimacy of a government that is moving through this process is at stake in this, but it's also important from an operational point of view, because being inclusive and being participatory from the beginning of the process, right through every stage of consultations, of drafting, of informing, um, and then later communicating and disseminating and working through follow-up, is really important um, also in bringing the needs of the population, the real security concerns of from the from the very local level to, to the national level into the missions and the work of the security sector itself. And this is one of working in this sort of inclusive participatory way is one of the only ways, but one of the most important ways that you're going to be able to link security at the local community level to national security policy at the highest level. And that is really essential for most contexts which are dealing with peace processes and transitions because when there's a disconnect between local conflict or community violence and disagreements at the national level, that's never um, a very useful foundation for human security moving forward. So creating a national security strategy that is gonna be inclusive and participatory would I say it would be my my key piece of um, advice? Uh, Dr. Feli, uh, I, I, Dr. Dr. Feli, many thanks for this very uh, valuable presentation and the advice. And uh, you were uh, present in the Khartoum meeting that we did. Oh, you you'll you'll be present. Pardon me in the next March meeting. And of course, we will be going over all of the, and we will see all of the challenges facing Sudan at the time. And I'm for sure you will be uh, 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 there to help in anything uh, for this great transition for the Sudan, which is going through a very difficult uh, uh, stage. And uh, it's a nation that needs any kind of help, all kinds of help. And it's wonderful to see the friends of the Sudan uh, being there. So many thanks, great thanks uh, for your answers to these questions. We will be transitioning now to Dr. Emil. And uh, like I mentioned about Dr. Emil, we will be uh, speaking through the uh, practical and the realistic um, view and uh, description of regarding the uh, uh, the security policy uh, for the state of Burkina Faso. So as an expert, he will be giving us uh, a part of his experience through the uh, actual, uh, actual uh, practical uh, experience that he lived in Burkina Faso. Dr. Emil, on your, from your review, uh, the national security situation in the continent of Africa. Can you tell the uh, listeners about the uh, about uh, implementing and creating a national security, developing a national security policy? Uh, and if you could uh, concentrate on the the humanitarian level or the individual level and the government and the system and the participation of uh, the citizenry and uh, and what portions of it are behind closed doors and how much of it is open for the people. Dr. Emil, welcome and please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Luca. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and happy Ramadan to uh, all of us. Uh, thank you also, Shirley, for uh, for paving the way because she provided um, the theoretical framework and also the uh, the steps for developing a national security strategy uh, in the African context. Uh, let me start by answering this question by making a, a background of the case studies. The national security strategy case studies. It started in March uh, 2018, and was uh, it, uh, the Africa Center decided uh, to undertake uh, 
a, a study on African national security strategies. And I was involved uh, in this process as well as uh, Dr. Luca, uh, the dean. And 10 African countries were involved in this study, namely South Africa, uh, Botswana, Madagascar, South Sudan, uh, Nigeria, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, Senegal, and then Burkina Faso. It was very important, but this country was uh, just designed randomly. And we had the following findings. It's very important when you listen to what uh, Dr. Felix uh, said. We observed that in these countries, only very only Nigeria and and, and, uh, and Nigeria had a, a, a national security strategy, a written document on national security strategy. The other countries uh, developed a defense policy, and then this defense policy it can only add that they were state the state centric oriented, and they were solely written by military experts. They decided in this document to exclude the local population, to exclude uh, academia, to exclude the, the civil society, to exclude, uh, uh, I mean, all the stakeholders involved in the national security. They even excluded in their vision, uh, human security. And you all know that now we are all facing COVID. COVID is, is a no military threat, but it's a, a serious threat to uh, national security in, in all the countries. The second very important finding of this study uh, undertook by ACSS is that we found out that there's an incoherence between the defense policy and the, the other existing security sectoral strategies. You have counterterrorism strategy, internal, strategy, internal security strategy, and there were no link between these strategies and then the, 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 the defense policies. And finally, the, regarding the, the involvement of citizens, as you, 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 you rightly asked me, it's only Nigeria and uh, Liberia really who had, uh, who got the citizens involved in the, in the process. Even though Liberia was in the, in the post-conflict situation, they managed somehow to, to get involved the population. But the, the Nigeria 2014 National Security Strategy uh, did not uh, totally uh, involve the population, but this lesson was, was learned in the 2019, and they managed to involve everybody. And finally, to answer to your question on secrecy and public, and public accessibility, you know that in Africa, most countries, the defense policies are document uh, which remains very confidential and classified. But when we take the case of uh, Nigeria and Liberia, the national security uh, policies are published in the, in, this, in the internet. And once again, uh, it's very important to know that uh, these, can, these countries are still facing the how to, how to uh, find a coherent and effective communication strategy. Because when you start writing the national security strategy, it's difficult to balance to balance the rights to inform the public and also the, the, uh, how to regulate and protect the, the information uh, in order to protect the national security interest. So it's always a very difficult exercise. I think uh, uh, we'll come back later on. Uh, but generally, defense policies are, uh, I mean, the, the operational plans in the defense policy were uh, classified. But in the national security, we have a non-classified version published, and the classified one is uh, they will just remove the, the operational information and they send it to the national security decision-making authorities. These are a little bit the status of the policy documents and the national security document in the, the African context, where we had a study on uh, 10. 10 of them. Yeah, it's Dr. Emil. Thank you very much, Dr. Emil, for sharing and for this uh, insightful diagnosis, especially regarding the African experience uh, pertaining uh, to the uh, situation of security in Africa. There are so many lessons learned 
uh, so many lessons that we drew from the expertise of uh, African uh, countries. The uh, other question that I would like to ask you, Dr. Emil, is as follows. As you participated, sir, uh, in an efficient way uh, as a, 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 of course, the head or the the uh, scientific commission, uh, and in your designing, designing, you participated in designing a process in Burkina Faso. Uh, uh, could you, sir, share with us and with the participants uh, how the process started? and the different styles that were adopted in the development of the national security strategy and uh, how uh, and how uh, all the, the of course the, the efficient participation of the people uh, was uh, was included as I'm, I'm, I'm not talking only about the uh, women i'm talking about women and the youth generation and so how was the process handled and how was the designing process uh, handled overall uh, dr emil the, the floor is yours thank you uh, thank you very much uh, dr luca uh, it's uh, i think it is a very a very long question you're asking me it takes me to go through the, the entire process of the national security strategy development of, uh, of my country, Burkina Faso. Uh, it's through our participants in developing the national security strategy of Burkina Faso. And I was a member of the scientific uh, committee. The scientific committee is part of the drafting committee. I will come later on on how it was uh, organized. But I will start to just to provide a very brief uh, background of the of how uh, Burkina Faso initiated a national security uh, strategy. Uh, Burkina Faso uh, went through a, a popular a popular insurrection in 2014, as you know, just like what Sudan did in 2018, and we had a, a transition government in 2015. We faced facing the political instability, tumultuous civil military re relations, uh, insecurity in uh, both urban and rural areas, terrorism, and and so on. And it's against the, this context, uh, this background, that Burkina Faso decided uh, to to develop uh, uh, its national security uh, strategy. Uh, we started by convening a national forum on security. It's very important uh, to mention it. And the National Forum on Security started in 2017 and was initially initiated and led by the Ministry of Security. I will explain to you later why we, we had some challenges when we started developing uh, the, uh, the process. So the Minister, Minister of Security was the, the, the starting point. And the entry was also the, was then the national forum. The national forum. What is important to know is uh, the this forum really uh, involved all the stakeholders. It involved key actors in institutions of the security sector. I'm talking of ministries involved in national security, namely the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Administration. The Minister, Minister of Justice. Also, the political parties, whether you are from the opposition or the, the I mean, the ruling, uh, I mean, the government, academics, the civil society, they were all involved in this uh, drafting, uh, in this uh, forum. And then from this national forum, we decided to convene, I mean, to, to set up a, a drafting committee. Uh, following the recommendation we, we had in the in the national forum, we we, we had we, a, a drafting committee was then uh, set up. Uh, this committee had a mission to develop a national security strategy and a new architecture for the national security. We decided to abide, abide by the principles. This committee was multidisciplinary, and we also observed that national inclusive, inclusiveness was uh, was there. So we had to bring about uh, defense and security experts, academics, researchers, as well as representatives of ministries, uh, the one I just listed above, the National Assembly, the majority and the opposition political parties, trade unions, civil society organizations, and youth organizations. 
so the the drafting committee was uh, divided into four components. The first component is the oversight. The second one, the scientific committee. And the third one is the drafting committee. And the first one is the advisory group. I will not uh, waste too much time on this one, but I will only lay emphasis on, on the scientific committee because I was belonging to the scientific committee. The scientific committee was uh, consisted of 12 members, the 12 members with different backgrounds. And these backgrounds included six, uh, six defense and security experts and six from the, the, from the uh, academics. The six defense and security experts, it's very important to mention it. We had three, one from defense and one from the army, one from the Air Force and one from the gendarmerie. Uh, we had also two retired IGPs, uh, Inspector General of Police, and one from the National Assembly. For the lecturers and the universities, we decided to have in the team one anthropologist, it's very important, one political scientist, because we need him to let us know exactly how to analyze the political situation, one social economist, one linguist, one constitutional lawyer, and one historian. So these are the, 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 the key elements of the scientific committee. And the, uh, our role was to provide the strategic and scientific guidance and orientations to the process, and also play a key role when it comes to conciliate and make the final approval of uh, contested, contested issues. And, and finally, we had a, a very important role in getting the buy-in of the government. So we are regularly briefing Mr. President and his cabinet on how things are moving. Uh, the, so these are the, uh, the how we, we, we were structured. Regarding the, the, the issue of um, uh, the, the, the understanding the security, the scientific committee, we decided like Feli was just saying it, to have the vision, the security vision. And we were asked by the government to draft a national policy on defense and security. But at, the, at, uh, the, at, at our level, at the, the, the scientific committee, we decided after really interacting and, uh, and uh, conceptualizing to draft a national security policy and a national security strategy, because it was part of, of, of our role to, 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 to do this. Uh, and we argued and we defended because the government asked us to, 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 to draft a national security uh, policy on defense and security. But we think that we thought that national security policy and strategy concepts uh, were more holistic. National security policy and strategy can bring along the human security aspects. And of course, it encompasses defense and security. Defense security is embedded in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the national security. So uh, these concepts were uh, accepted and we started then doing the process. And the process we had three phases. The first, the first, the first uh, phase is meeting the government. We met the government, we had a seminar, a governmental seminar where Mr. President and all his cabinet were there, all the ministries. We sat down, we have to get their back in so that we get a convergence of political views and uh, of the entire government regarding the process. The second one is the consulting the, the institutions, the ministries, the categories of state, state actors and the civil society organization. And the last one at the end, we went back to the, to, for a regional consultations. And these consultations were made uh, possible. We, of course, added youth and women in all, all our, 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 in our process. In addition to, to the consultations, we had public conferences. Uh, these conferences were of uh, consultative nature, just to consult and have the opinions of the public. And uh, we also consulted 
uh, with thematic workshops and, and, and seminars. It's very important for us because when there's contested issues, we have to go back to thematic workshops and thematic seminars, and the scientific committee will then listen to the point of views and make conciliation and make sure there's a, a consensus. That was also one of the main role of the scientific committee. So that's how it's a, we, we, we came about. So issues like ethnicity, issues like stigmatization, ethnicity as stigmatization, issues like inter-community conflicts, issues like national unity and national unity and cohesion uh, were addressed. And it was very important for us to, to really openly discuss about this uh, national security uh, issues. Thank you, uh, Dr. Luca. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Emil. No doubt that the uh, experience from Burkina Faso uh, is uh, no doubt uh, is something that the Sudanese can lo learn from. And uh, thank you for sharing with us uh, how one can try to find a, uh, a consensus on the uh, shared security problems, especially when it comes to defense. A uh, question before I last, if I may. Perhaps you did face uh, a number of challenges, of course. What are these challenges and how did you overcome these challenges in uh, the uh, developing of the National Security Plan? Okay, thank you, Dr. Luca. This is a very practical question and I want to be very uh, frank. Uh, we, in the, contact, in the conduct of the process, we faced uh, many challenges. I will just, I will just highlight the, the, the very important ones. The first one is the concept of, of uh, the, the challenge of conceptual clarification. I think is uh, Dr. Feli mentioned it. It's very important. At the very beginning, we have to define what we what, what we understand by security, and it's not an, an easy exercise. It was very difficult because even from the government, we didn't have a clear direction of what they, what they, they mean by security. So this was the first challenge. It took us at least uh, one month to, to just edit a glossary. Uh, in this glossary, we define key national security concepts. And we managed to validate it through workshops and seminars. And uh, this is the, 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 I think that was the, the, our very first challenge. And the second one is the, the consensus. Still, we had a scientific committee play a key role, but we encountered, encountered a, a lot of uh, problem with uh, the, the, having the consensus throughout the process. And we, what we did is like I did, I uh, said, it's through thematic seminars and workshops. The scientific committee, if you know that there's a contested issue, if there's no consensus on one issue, we just organized a seminar or a workshop and we bring all the actors and all the, the stakeholders, uh, we discuss uh, the issue and we, we make a final decision. The third challenge is the planning uh, the process. We had a problem planning the process and uh, having the sust sustainable resources. We honestly, we, uh, we had a poor planning of our process. We were thinking we could make it in six months. But it's now we are getting to the end of the of the process, so you can you can guess it's about uh, uh, almost two years, if 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 not uh, more. And um, the resources were not really available, so at the end of the day, we have to go back to the uh, to seek support from from the external partners and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the United Nations. That's 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 the, these are the uh, things we I need to really highlight them. We had also a conflict around the leading institution of the process. I told you at the very beginning that the Minister of Security was leading the process, but at the end of the day, they had a conflict with the Minister of Defense thinking that he does his, his business. And it, we, end up, we, we, we ended up taking the process, the entire process to the presidency. And finally, it's Mr. President who decided to uh, to I mean to take charge of the um, he's not himself but his cabinet to take charge of the process. So this conflict it's a real, it was a big challenge. We have also challenges uh, regarding um, 
the uh, I mean the emergency security situation, like uh, fairly said, it's a very complex and volatile security situ situation. We are facing terrorism and and other uh, problems. So uh, we, we were working under pressure, and the pressure was too much, and we have to 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 sometimes drop the national security policy and go back to to. to to, to address a very, very, very emergent, a, a very critical security situation. So that's some of the challenges we faced, and we managed uh, as well as we can to address them and to overcome some of them. But still, there's still some challenges remaining. Thank you, Dr. Luca. Oh, super Gizem, Dr. Emil. Thank you, Dr. Emil for sharing with us these challenges. No doubt that the concepts and principles when it comes the, in the security sector are very important. And some of the challenges when it comes to the consensus uh, of the national opinion, when it comes to funding and to assure or the reiteration uh, that the national uh, control of this is very important as a tool. Last question, what would be the last advice if you could present or give to the Sudanese people if they started this journey of trying to write and develop a national security plan? Uh, Mr. Dr. Emil, this is uh, your time to answer, please. Okay, thank you very much, Luca. Deriving from the, my experience as a member of, of the scientific committee uh, in charge of drafting the national security policy and strategy of my country, uh, and what I observed from the challenges we faced, I think my, my first piece of advice would be to ensure the existence of a firm political will and commitment and a strong leadership. This, for me, is the prerequisite, the firm political will and commitment and a strong leadership. Because as you know, national security strategy development and security sector reform are fundamentally highly sensitive political processes. And it impacts, in fact, it impacts a lot on state st structures and power relations. It has significant implication for the state monopoly on the use of force. And therefore, we know that there will be a lot of uh, problems. It implies also the redistribution of power and resources. It could bring a problem. It's, it entails redefining key notion, notions of the social contract. Okay, so it's, it's, it's restarting a lot of things and fi finally, my piece of advice is to manage to get the political actors along because political actors can be the spoilers. The spoilers, if you have uncommitted political leaders who can, you can act as influential, they can act as influential spoilers and they can also discredit the process. And I think this is a very good advice to have a firm political commitment for the, for the, for the leadership and get the leadership really ready to address. The second piece of advice is very important. Uh, I think it's, it's the national ownership. The national security strategy development must be conceived, must be designed, and must be led by Sudanese. We know it's a technical and financial and financially uh, uh, challenging endeavor. We need to uh, involve uh, the, 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 the international assistance. The international assistance must be demand driven. It's very important. It must be demand driven and the demand must be homegrown and aligned with the national agenda and the security priorities. So after do these two prerequisites, I think we can embark on, 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 on developing the, the strategy by starting convening a national conference, uh, clarifying the concepts, 
at the very inception of the process, uh, making sure that you have a participatory and, and, and inclusive process, uh, having a very uh, holistic approach. And because this is very important, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this point is very important. At the very beginning of, the, of our drafting, uh, we saw that military, military personnel are still advocating for a state-centric approach of the national security strategy. And the civilian counterparts also were believing, I don't know, we were believing that national security strategy is a military business. So how to, to, to bring the two, I mean, elements together was not, uh, is, was not easy at all. So it's very important uh, to, to really make sure that the, the scientific committee is multidisciplinary and the scientific committee helps a lot to build a critical mass of, of, uh, of people in order to bring the gap, uh, to bridge the gap of knowledge. It's very important because you start with people who have not having the, uh, I mean, a notion on national security and you have the scientific committee to have to bridge this gap and bring people to this common understanding. So these are the my very simply piece of uh, advice I can give to uh, Sudanese if they want to embark on this process. Thank you, Luca. Oh, uh, uh, Dr. Emil. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Emil and Dr. Fairley. No doubt that your uh, participation today, where you see that the most important thing is, is the national ownership is so important when it comes to uh, developing the national security. And the most important people here uh, in this case scenario is the Sudanese people to develop and mold and to develop the national security. Our, uh, our goal here is to give room to the Sudanese for them to find national solutions and for it to come from a national desire and for it to be sustainable. And it's not uh, uh, to fill the moment, no, but to it's start a national dialogue and uh, to determine their priorities so that can they can make a roadmap uh, to develop and to better the uh, uh, security sector. So thank you so much, Dr. Fairley and Dr. Emil, for your very valuable participation and that we hope that it will be a very uh, important uh, uh, starting point for the Sudanese people in this very challenging and unique uh, journey. Uh, of course, the security sector is very important because uh, it, this is something that is a part of every element in life, especially when it comes to a democratic transitioning nation like in the Sudan.